is the time to market from idea to, uh, to, to actually sort of streeting out with something has compressed radically. Um, so one of the things I want us to think about, and if you guys have feedback as we go through the questions, is how, how does that change uh, things for individuals who want, have great ideas and who want to start, uh, start something, um, as well as people who are clinging to sort of the, the, the edge of a viable business and looking over their shoulder at people who are trying to sort of uh, put them out of business um, or compete with them. How, how, do you, how do you maintain sort of a, an ongoing running value as a service provider to whatever your community is? The notion the notion of writing apps has been um, sort of compared to a gold rush, and people have described it as being sort of, you know, you've got a, a, an, an exponentially growing community chasing a small number of potential eyeballs or users. Um, but there seems like there's this tremendously lucrative business underneath that of writing apps for other people. And I think that um, uh, uh, Outfit 7 is in that business, and I'd like to hear more about um, sort of what is it, what is that, what, how does that business work? And, and as, a, as an entrepreneur and as an engineer, how can you liken writing apps for other people, you know, being an ESPN or a startup that wants to do a travel site, how is that the same or different to writing apps for yourself? You know, arguably, you know, people with great content to emerge to the top, and then creating a self-reinforcing effect that people discover the great content. So in our case, it was like uh, some great engineers in Slovenia, uh, never had experience with game, our, our EDA was not in gaming. Uh, they wanted to do something very, very different. We didn't want to do another game, we didn't want to create another game company. We wanted to create something that, you know, inspires many, many people and, and us ultimately. So what we did is we, we, we didn't want to spend too much money on developing the initial product. We, we knew that talent is about online. We went and researched the three D artist community and found the most, you know, most attractive three D art to us. We picked three uh, D model of cat, uh, spent some time on animating and voice and, and developing the app and put it you know, in the app store. And organically, we got to a million users in the first thirteen days. Uh, and the company is based in Slovenia. Never had exposure to Silicon Valley or the gaming industry before. So this is really, I think, uh, revolutionary in its you know, purest sense. And you, you look at the successful companies in the App Store today, you see quite a few of them are not US-based. For example, Doodlejump is out of Croatia, Gajar, Lithuania, Cut the Rope, Zephalep, Moscow, Russia, and so on and so on, right? Uh, so you have a sense that this is really the most meritocratic distribution channel to date, right? And we don't want it to change. You, you, you have people like you mentioned before, you know, someone mentioned before, Tiny Wings, again, one single guy from Germany. So it is possible to create huge value by creating great content and putting it from many, many users because the distribution channel is so efficient. It removes all friction away. Right? It can reach millions of people and they can un unbox and, un and, and experience the app within one click. So we, so we, have, uh, we have an increasingly efficient distribution mechanism. Um, Raj, so I noticed uh, that one of the things you're involved in is natural language. Right? Natural language as a science and as a math generally involves either taking other people's transforms and turning them into code or doing like really deep, dark, you know, black science. Right? The startup I was in uh, before here, we had an NLP black box and it was, you know, you don't ever want to go in there except for the one guy, right? Um, that represents a really significant chunk of IP. How, you know, you, if you've got hyper-efficient distribution mechanisms and you've got people in Estonia, Slovenia, Russia, Australia, Japan, China, Sri Lanka who are all looking over everybody's shoulder, how do you, how do you maintain like a, an investment in fundamental computer science in a universe in which, you know, whatever it is you come out with could get copied by somebody in Estonia tomorrow? Uh, that's a tricky question. I think, uh, uh, so, uh, just sort of, uh, Within SRI, I'm not, I'm not uh, speaking on behalf of SRI, but it's just sort of what I've seen. Um, IT, uh, so SRI is interesting in that they have, you know, pharmaceutical and medical research, they have physical sciences, they have life sciences, uh, and other groups. And what's interesting is a lot of the technologies that are developed in those groups are inherently defensible. Uh, you can't rebuild this robotic design. Uh, overnight, it's a significant endeavor, or you're not going to discover this new kind of drug. Uh, it's a significant endeavor. Um, I think within the realm of IT, 
and that sort of research, a lot of those efforts are a combination of these R&D labs as well as university research. Uh, and what I'm finding more and more, it's not about a specific algorithm that somebody, uh, you know, uh, page rank is a beautiful when you look at it in terms of here's a specific algorithm that can so simple to explain that can do so much better than what was out there at the time. Um, I'm finding that it's much more about the packaging of the different pieces together. But I don't think anybody would disagree that uh, once you're out in, out in the market, it's a race. And uh, there might be uh, a specific technical approach that you've taken uh, that, that maybe has created some advantage, but I would fully expect that somebody would be able to duplicate that within two or three months. So really it's about making sure uh, maybe it's the business side of things, maybe it's, maybe it's the execution, it's how fast you can run and package it all together. And that's what I'm finding in, uh, in a in much greater way within at least SRI within the IT group is it's about packaging a lot of methods and approaches and testing things that haven't yet been tested with known algorithms. So, you know, can you apply the same sort of technology algorithm but in a completely different domain? Uh, but but I agree. I, you know, I think uh, I, 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 if, if somebody sees something and they want to build it, they're going to figure it out. So I think um, another way of putting this is that, or, or thinking about it, is that if it takes you, you know, a certain amount, this amount of time, and let's say, to, to, to develop something interesting that, that really represents fundamentally sort of unique thinking, um, you've got as many of your screw-ups in there uh, that you've learned from as you do your successes. And if somebody simply tries to carbon copy the results, they actually don't inherit the fact that you've been sort of the curator of that from, you know, from inception to, to, to solution. So there's a good chance that because they haven't learned from your mistakes, they, their, their solution contains things that you figured out six months ago that you yeah. that as a disaster. Uh, I would, yeah, I think, I think a huge part of the IP is having the people who've been through that development process, as you described, and understands the learnings. So um, a number of tests were run with different algorithms with respect to NLP, uh, and knowing that this particular approach, or this statistical approach, or uh, this semantic approach, or whatnot, uh, works better in these conditions, that kind of, that kind of knowledge or IP is much harder uh, to just communicate on a wiki page, or communicate on a web page. Don't do it in this use case, or don't do it in that use case. And I think that, that's the kind of knowledge that that's, it's all about hiring the right people uh, who have that specific domain expertise. Now, separate conversation altogether is the entire uh, uh, patentability, patentability of, uh, of uh, technology of IT and how that could impact innovation. And you definitely see a lot of that come into play with larger companies. Does anybody on the panel want to speak out in favor of software patents? Does anybody in the audience want to speak out in favor of software patents? Come on, so, like, I'm going to have to pretend I like software patents just to, to create a kind of yeah. issue. Uh, my former employer is currently uh, enthusiastically exercising software patents, uh, so you know, um, no, I'm not going to take that position. Um, uh, okay, um, Mike, we, we, uh, we heard from Andre about this idea that, um, that you can be successful because of the reduced friction and distribution and your ability to gain eyeballs very quickly from sort of anywhere in the world. But um, we still certainly from an entrepreneur perspective see a difference uh, between your ability to not just get funding or support, but sort of like the whole cultural sort of notion of like who's next door to you, who's in the coffee shop, who can you turn to for help? If you need if you need somebody to bang out a really fast web front end of something, like how competitive is it and are they your friends and do they work just next door or are you just sort of throwing it up in the air and crossing your fingers? Um, what do you still see as being, or do you still see there being fundamental differences between sort of tech rich or tech, you know, places like the Silicon Valley uh, that have been, you know, doing this for a long time versus complete, you know, frontier kind of environments uh, from an app perspective and an entrepreneur perspective like Slovenia or Russia or uh, Australia or so on? I think there are advantages on both sides of that. I agree completely with Raj's statement that. A lot of the advantage to get when you come out with an eventual product is all of the failures that went before. And when you've got a supporting community, you include the other people in your community who are able to share their experiences of failing the same endeavor in the past. So you've actually got a lot to build on top of outside as well as inside. 
That being said, there's also some advantage to fresh thinking every once in a while. And finding a way to split the difference between those of being able to pull in uh, learned experiences shared by other people, as well as the willingness to experiment on your own by reducing the cost of experimentation internally, that's where the real sweet spot is right now, I think, in terms of functional. Um, and so, do you, where do you see, uh, you've got, I mean, you, you do something in Barcelona, right? Yeah. So I've held that with the Mobile 2.0 conference over there before. And when, you, when you're out there, do you, when, when you're, what are, are the issues that people in, in Barcelona are facing identical to the ones that they're facing in, in Silicon Valley or elsewhere? Yeah, yeah, they're pretty similar, actually. There's, there's enough of a supporting community in a couple of different areas that I feel like they're operating in the same way that Silicon Valley has been. I think London is another area where the, the community is, is very similar to what's going on here in terms of technical endeavor. Now the business environments are still much different. A lot of times people's approaches to monetization and people's approaches to how, how to build their business are different, but they at least have the supporting community and the way that people approach solving problems is, is getting to look very similar. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I would say that um, London, like the Silicon Roundabout, uh, you know, feels a lot like, um, in some ways, sort of the Portland startup scene. It's smaller, but it's very, everybody knows each other. You know, when I was there, we were, our first place was right across the street from Last FM. Everybody knew the founders of Moo, everybody knew the founders of Doppler before they got picked up. I mean, there was, it, it was a, uh, there was a very, you know, intense community there. And, and the, the games panel earlier, like the indie games scene in particular in the UK is extraordinarily strong, um, with a lot of really, uh, amazing work uh, coming out of that space. So that's another thing I think we can look at around geographic specialization is that geographies can get very good at, at specific kinds of things as well. You know, you can get very good at being an indie game developer and everybody you hang out with and do stuff with is an indie game developer and then you solve a lot of your sort of shared problems together. Yeah, so we're actually, we're starting up an office down in LA and we've seen exactly that situation where the startup environment down there is beginning to look a lot like Silicon Valley in the sense that entrepreneurs are supporting other entrepreneurs, the events look the same, the way that people have come together in online communities look the same, but the businesses that they're generating are in a completely different direction even when they're in the same environment. The mobile folks down there have much more of a focus on monetization early and virtual goods and things like that. People up here, they do some virtual goods stuff, but a lot of them are building services that are more based on the shooters. Now, I think it's so an interesting observation about sort of the social mechanism, the mechanics there is that if the people you're competing with are also the people you drink with, like, you want to beat them, but not so badly that they can't go on drinking with you anymore, right? So it's, it's not like a socialist kind of thing where everybody must be the same, right? Uh, um, uh, you know, but on the flip side, it is enough where it's like you want the tide to rise all the raise all the votes because you you know these are your friend like these are your friends and be like dude you crashed yesterday never mind you around uh, you know oh you got bought you get to buy us around right so I think that um, that's certainly a difference in the culture I see from the nineties for example where you know because they were bigger more monolithic organizations you really personified the evil of your competitor and you wanted to crush them. Right, and you probably would never go out drinking with you know somebody like that because they must be totally alien and evil and wrong. Right? Was it a book about about yeah, telling? Uh, it's called uh, My Idea to Start in Twenty One Days. The idea to Start. Yeah. The title is actually called uh, Making Bacon. Uh, from idea to start up in 21 days, and the, the concept of you know, literally we were selling bacon on the internet. Um, and it was an exercise uh, for a group of us to get together and just kind of say, how quickly can we launch a full blown business with supply chain, e commerce, website fulfillment, everything? And uh, we did, it turns out we, we set the target at 30 days, we're able to do it at 21. Um, but literally, you know, we had a bunch of suppliers, mom and pop. Um, Farms across the country, and uh, it's all cured. You know, bacon's a, a cured product. So, literally, we get the stuff shipped in and, and then move it out. And uh, ended up running the business for about a year. At its peak during the holiday season, apparently, bacon's a big holiday item. Uh, we, were, we were moving about 600 pounds of bacon a day. So, like, you would come in and go out. I mean, it was, it was nuts. And then, our, and then our biggest competitor ended up acquiring us. It's like any, and yeah, there was another site on the internet that was selling bacon. <laughs> so, what, so, so taking what you learned from that um, and applying it to urban airship where you are now, what are the what are the things that actually really clearly carry over from from bacon to push uh, technology? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm with Urban Airship, and we do push notifications and app purchase on a variety of different platforms. So we really help developers, you know, drive engagement and monetize their apps. And, and I think the biggest thing that we learned was. 
especially in the space that we're in right now, you just don't know if there's a market for what you're doing. So, you know, we when we came up with the idea for Urban Airship, we literally launched the company in 30 days. Um, we, we had a shipped product. It wasn't, we announced, and we had a website, it was, we actually had an API, we had developer documentation, you know, the website was horrible, but it didn't matter. And then we showed up at a developer conference um, that we didn't have a ticket to. Uh, we went down to Costco and bought a bunch of Danishes, showed up at the line, uh, that everybody's lined up to, uh, to go to the uh, to the speed note at WWDC, and uh, just handed out these these donuts basically, and said, "Hey, you know, we, we can help you with push notifications and in-app purchase." And sure enough, we picked up. Uh, you know, we ended up picking up Tapulus and ESPN that day. We, we didn't know it until after the fact. They're like, "Yeah, we got you in that line," and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, the best fifteen hundred dollars on donuts we've ever spent." <laughs> uh, but you know, we, we didn't know if there would be a business there, and so we had to launch as quickly as we could. And sure enough, there was. And what's what's interesting is we had a bunch of competitors announce the day that we were live, and we ended up kind of laughing some of those folks, I think, um, uh, because of that. So um, uh, we have we have 17 minutes according to that time, but seven is this? Do I get 10 extra when this runs out? Somebody, can you find out? Just because I've got this, my brain's starting to hurt about the fact that I have two timers that are saying I've got 10 extra minutes or not. I have to start wrapping, or I've got 10. 16 minutes. Um, so it suddenly dawns on me with your uh, kind comment to point out the fact that I need to do Botox because I'm old. Um, that uh, I uh, and arguably, you know, my large company are radically different um, from what you guys are doing uh, and from the work you're involved in. Um, you, you know, it is, if you Prog, you know, think about sort of what you face, and when I think about sort of the reality you face, and going back to this notion of intellectual property, a lot of times when you started a business back in the 90s, what you did was you spent a lot of time using terms like barrier to entry, right? You were trying to erect these strong fortifications which nobody could climb over, and it was going to take you years to do, and that's why you were so focused on things like software patents and, and the creation of intellectual property, because it was part of the armor that you used to, so this one's right? All right, so we only have a few minutes. That's good. Uh, or bad. Um, so, uh, if, if someone were to tell you tomorrow, we can give you this magic wand, and this magic wand can make it like it was back then, where you actually are, things have slowed down, and you are now capable of erecting these strong fortifications, you know, which other people are going to have such a hard time climbing over. Is that, like, can you even see a value to that anymore, or is that just gone? Any of you? I think it's just gone. Uh, I don't think there ever was a time where you really could erect that strong of a barrier. It's just that there was this sort of consensual hallucination that you could, so nobody attacked it. <laughs> that is a treatable comment, consensual hallucination. All right, I'm going to pretend for a second that this piece of paper I filed in the U.S. Patent Office is capable of killing you, provided you agree that it is capable of killing you. Right? Yes. Um, go ahead. I would add, using a sort of an SRI adage that researchers always say, it depends. Uh, uh, there's certainly uh, businesses where some specific relationships or domain experience or uh, expertise is naturally defensible. Uh, those who sell to operators, uh, this sort of pre-egalitarian uh, uh, e app store ecosystem, uh, spe specific relationships can matter and can, can form uh, defensibility. I don't know technology standpoint, besides the fact that you can host a website for $5 today and back then it was $500 a day so you didn't have so many parked, uh, parked sites, uh, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I agree with Mike, I think uh, uh, there's, there, there is no uh, fortification, sort of port of five forces, uh, so that sort of goes away. Yeah, we've, we did that recently, the Porter Five Forces exercise was strategic. It was like, it was just making my head explode. It was like, are you kidding me? The amount of time it took us to do the slide, we could have had a web service deployed. Like, and who eats the slide? We do. Right? It's not like it's making anybody else's life, like, incredibly valuable. Okay, so, um, one of the things uh, we've been looking at a lot lately is this notion of, um, you know, uh, Andre pointed out this incredible point uh, about the frictionless of the economy. On the flip side, there's a lot of research that indicates that it's the top performers in the app-based economies that are garnering the vast majority of the rewards, be they money or recognition or startup or whatever it is they're after, right? So uh, there's a research paper that says that 50 of the top, uh, uh, the 50 top apps are responsible for 50% of the downloads um, 
on iTunes. Uh, no, no revenue. Right. Not revenue. Not revenue. Not revenue. So, yeah, but is, so is revenue more balanced? Absolutely. So this is a huge long tail, right? This 400,000 apps in the App Store. When Steve Jobs says there's $2 billion picked the apps today, what it really means is 300 million to the top 25, and then 1.7 billion to everybody else, right? So it's really, really long tail, right? And I think it's great. Yeah, so, so I'm glad that that is exactly where I was ho hoping we'd go. That is this notion of the long tail economy be actually, um, you know, what, what is, you know, prognosticate for a second, you know, we can close and I'll just ask each of you, over the next five years, can you think of sort of the one thing, and if you had a magic wand and you could make one thing happen in this world, like just point at Goku Chi, what, 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 what would you point that at to, to make the best long-term viable, sort of truly thriving long-term economy? Like is, are there things that are, you know, is there anything missing? Maybe there is. Uh, I think that there hasn't been as much activity on the uh, mobile for enterprise side as there could be. And if we saw more there, it would lead to, I think, a richer environment. Um, there's plenty of stuff on the consumer side. I think it would be fantastic. I would love to see a little more business activity. Okay, so mobile for enterprise, stop. Uh, a viable third platform. Okay, so the third alternative. And, and uh, I would posit that the third alternative actually needs to be substantially different in sort of nature and tone than the first two. Like, you know, just trying to go ahead and... I think it, it, it needs, needs to be competitive. Right. right. Because it's, it's not real and it's, you know, we don't know about Windows Phone 7. We're hoping, you know, we're hoping that's going to be it. But there's got to be another alternative out there. Yeah, I mean, I, and I would say, you know, this is a great opportunity for the uh, uh, you know, open software people to start, you know, come on, you guys should all be standing up and going, oh, right? Because this is clearly an opportunity where if ever there was an opportunity for open to come in and say, we are substantially different, right? We are the ones who allow programmable recommendation engines, multiple store systems, multiple uh, uh, affinity models, you know, like, we're, we are the open guys as contrasted to, to, you know, serious, you know, competitors. You know, I think, I think open is sort of an immune response to some form of monopoly, right? I mean, that's really kind of what I think happened with Linux. And it's ironic, everyone was like, oh, Linux is going gonna, is gonna to take out Microsoft's business on the desktop. And ironically, it's skipping the desktop and going to a more interesting space. You know, every single one of those Android phones is running Linux, and everybody kind of forgets that. Um, yeah. So but also, interestingly enough, there are aspects to the Android business that it are in fact a proprietary vertical, right? So, like access to maps is not a you know access to the marketplace is not truly open, right? So the the software that it's built on, in other words, the, the stuff that shows with your phone, is all open, but the services aren't, and that's the magic. I mean, even Eric Schmidt said the magic's in the cloud, yeah. right? And every single one of those handsets that goes out, it's just like the 90s all over again. You've got, you're handing, you know, Samsung's selling all these devices, but they're handing a user to Google for every single time you do it. All right. Uh, net neutrality around user data. I think uh, um, you've seen them. Yeah. Stop there. I'll stop. No, no, that's good. We we're over, but net neutrality, uh, I absolutely agree for, yeah. around user data. So this is, uh, this would be, the, it's my data. I own it. I control it. I can move it around. Yes. We've seen equalization on distribution and monetization. Things have gone open, but user data is being tightly guarded today. Right. Uh, okay. For, for, for good reason. Yep. One, either of you? I'll just jump in and just okay. say, um, even though it would benefit us greatly, <laughs> um, and I get the caveat of that, I'd like to see um, more, more stores, more app stores, basically. Um, more app stores available on more platforms, and for those stores to be open and potentially start uh, distributing extra I agree. Issue of five apps, Trevor. We're a big fan of that. More stores. I also happen to be a big fan of that too. Um, Andre, close. I think Smart is not great. I mean, this one has so many sensors, and you have all my entire Facebook graph. Um, that my my experience with not them should be very different than two yours, right? So I, I want a phone that recommends me services and apps that I should use in real time, based on location, based on social graph. Cool. All right, thank you very much, and thanks for coming to the show, and I hope you enjoy the rest of it.